I'm really grateful that we've actually managed to complete people for the third panel, for the second panel, with three people. So we've got a stunning following act. But this, these are media celebrities on social media for different things. So Gigi does a lot of social media work on, on Instagram in particular as a sex coach and sex therapist. And Erin kicks the asses of everybody, of us and our profession on Twitter with like 13,000, 12, 13,000 followers um, commenting on therapist abuse. And I think it's a really valuable uh, Twitter feed. So please take it away and tell us about your involvement in social media and what you get out of it and what tips you might have for people. I straddle the world between um, being a therapist and being a sexual health journalist. So that's really where I got my start. Um, I have a wide following across social media, but as well um, through my writing, which is how all of this began. I started writing about sex in 2017, mostly because I had no filter and because there wasn't a lot of good information on the internet about sex. It was basically like, not information, but articles. It was mostly like fun, that reverberation is something. Um, like, you know, sex positions articles, not a lot of really good in-depth journalism. So I decided to get into that. Um, and then I wrote an article for Teen Vogue about anal sex, thinking nothing of it, because to me, that's nothing. I was like, anal sex, Teen Vogue, sure, editor, whatever you say. And that shit went crazy. Like, I was called a sodomite on Fox News. Um, my, the troll comments were out of control, where people were going into my Instagram, looking for my friends who were tagged in photos so they could harass them. And that, unfortunately for the trolls, led to a book deal. So I wrote a book, and then I decided to get uh, certified in sex education. So I've kind of been coming at this from like a very top of, like coming from social media down to becoming more involved in like the expert um, world of it. So being, so like the, the, the thing about Instagram, I want to talk about the importance of Instagram and why social media is such an important thing for therapists. Um, Instagram is, there's a good side of Instagram and there's a lot of really great benefits to it and then there's sort of a darker side when it comes to Instagram. Um, firstly, it makes uh, education just so accessible for people. Um, one of the, and it brings this mental health as aspect to the masses that you probably wouldn't get otherwise because like as so many of the other experts who are up here before said, doing one-to-one -one therapy is really beneficial but like there's only a limit to your time and there's a limit to how much you can do that. So being able to scale and being able to give that to a wider audience is really important. Um, especially when it comes to messages about sex, there is a lot of terrible information out there. And so like my goal with what I do on social media is to normalize and to make people feel seen and heard and to be very queer inclusive and honestly extremely authentic. Like you will see videos of me wearing my Hannibal Lecter light mask with LED red lights behind it and talking about like vulva diversity. So I'm just like, I'm here, I'm doing my light mask, here I am talking about vulva diversity. And I think that being just really authentic and being yourself is a really important aspect of this work and it's what makes me kind of accessible to like a wider audience. Um, talking about sex is, uh, for like, talking about sex in like a really sex positive way on Instagram, this is where we're gonna get into the darker stuff. It used to be such a beautiful place for talking about sex in a really open way. And then in December of 2020, Instagram decided it did not like sex anymore. It didn't love it before that, but now it was like, we're done with sex. So there's an enormous amount of censorship. And this is something that I think people who are, it's not just sex therapists who need to think about this, but all queer therapists, because they do not like queer people. They do not like sex. They really don't like anything that's not white and heteronormative. They like really sexy ads, but they don't want anything sexual. They definitely don't want sex positivity. So it's become a very strange world to navigate. Like if you write the word sex, which you cannot write anymore. You don't have to change it to like SEGS, like S-E-G-G-S, which the algorithm has now figured out means sex, so now you have to change it to something else. That's part of this. It's a very challenging thing to keep up with these algorithms that are actively trying to bring you down. Um, I have like a huge following on Instagram, but like only a small percentage of what I see is being viewed by my audience because I talk about sex. And they do what, I'm sure a lot of you know about this term, but it's called shadow banning. And they make it so that you are taken out of the algorithm, you're taken away from the like, general viewing public and people can no longer find your content. Um, and I think sometimes this can be like, 
Instagram, by the way, will tell you that they do, do not actively participate in the act of shadow banning. It's a very gatekeepery culture. And so like sometimes I'll see a video that just like slips right through the cracks and you can see that it gets like hundreds of thousands of views and I'm like, this is what it would be like. But most of my videos are getting like a fraction of what they really could be because they censor this content. And I'm, I think a lot of like educators would openly say that like if we really didn't need Instagram to, to exist on the internet, we'd probably want to delete our accounts because it is very difficult to navigate. But at the same time, I still think it's really important. It's really vital for my business. It's very vital for therapist business to be able to give out information and be accessible and be a human being. And for people to know that you're there and that you're a person and that, like Alexis said, like you're not this wise elder, you're like an actual person who's fallible. Um, there are some challenges that can come out of kind of being a, like a larger internet presence and then also being in the therapy room. Um, people who used to come to me would often self-select. They wanted to work with me personally. And usually the first questions I would be asked were a lot about my career. And it's really, it was like a lot of navigation as I was moving into the therapy world to, to bring in like who I was as a therapist and who I was as a public figure. And while those two people are still me, they're still two different sides of me. And so who you're getting in the therapy room is not who you're getting online. And being able to integrate that and becoming more comfortable as like in the therapist's skin and not feeling the need to be performative or not feeling the need to be like a public figure um, took a lot of work and a lot of growth. But that's kind of where I am now. And with all that being said, social media is hugely important. It's huge for business growth. It just is the reality. And it's a really an amazing thing to get messages from followers and from readers who say that like, you know, they, I changed their lives or they like never loved their bodies until they like saw my stuff or like how much they love reading my newsletter because it just normalized these things that they had such insecurity about. And that's a really like important and beautiful thing. And honestly, like Instagram's algorithm can suck it because I'm not going anywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so I'm what I describe as an act accidental activist, and I think that's probably the same for many activists among us um, today. My immediate route into uh, therapy wasn't particularly unusual, but the me that turned up in the profession, um, a mixture of my experiences and my experience of myself, um, it felt surprisingly ill-fitting with my experience of pr the profession. Um, I'd begun as a client, and I quickly found that an inherent prizing of a person's authentic being didn't translate well from therapy to training. That's not what I was experiencing in training. Um, I began to see a lot happening that didn't feel um, in keeping with the what I understood to be the values of the profession, um, and that grew even more so when I qualified. So it's in my nature to speak about things that don't make sense to me. It's even more centrally in my nature to speak about things that people don't want to speak about. So when I found out that the therapy world didn't really want to hear about my special interest, which is harm in therapy, um, it became very important to me to break that taboo. And when I started, I had no idea that I'd become an activist. Um, the wonderful thing about Twitter, which is where I do 99% of my social media, um, is that you can find your people. A, a common cr criticism of Twitter is that it facilitates echo chambers and that this stifles change but I see it quite differently. Um, I grew up in a single parent family with my dad, who throughout my childhood was an active trade unionist. I learned that community, unity, and organization were vehicles of change. And I don't think I've ever felt community so strongly anywhere in this profession as I do on Twitter. Um, what's more, the community of activists I've met and worked with have not been limited to clinicians. Much of my most important learning as an activist and as a therapist come from listening to well-established and effective activism of marginalised groups, such as Stop Sim, the campaign against a harmful police policy of involvement in crisis intervention, and the actually autistic campaign against applied behaviour analysis, um, anti-racism, trans rights, and, and so on. Most of my activism is about power, where power lies, and whose narrative frames our understanding of the world and how we achieve equity. Twitter absolutely does not achieve equity, but the locus of power is different in social media. Narratives that are traditionally completely silenced are able to gain some traction. That's important. So many people have told me that seeing me and others discussing harm in therapy online 
um, has been a relief for them. They've said they felt they were the only person who experienced the very specific relational trauma that is often a feature of therapy harm. And that's activism to me. That's centering of a different narrative and changing assumptions about whose story counts. When I arrived in the therapy world as a trainee, all I knew about was my own experience of harmful therapy and those small number of people I had talked to online as a client. Becoming an activist on social media has widened my understanding of harm in therapy. It's opened up my activism. Um, what I've learned most clearly from my five years on Twitter is that harm in therapy is frequently in a symbiotic relationship with oppression. Oppression in our society and systems is replicated in the therapy room. Oppression causes harm and harm is a tool of oppression. Harm intersects so strongly with experiences of racism, heteronormative assumptions, ableism, classism and many other forms of discrimination and hate that harm clearly cannot be separated from marginalisation more widely. It quickly became apparent that if I'm to be a part of bringing about change with regard to harm in therapy, I must necessarily be standing up to all forms of oppression. It's like stand for all or stand for nothing. Twitter has afforded me an incredible opportunity to listen, learn, reflect on the roles of both my oppression and my privileges, um, and to locate my power and discover how I can use it constructively. Twitter's not only been a forum of activism for me individually, it's also been a, an important space for organisational challenge to the status quo. I imagine that many of you here are familiar with the pivotal role of the social media presence that Pink Therapy has occupied for many years. The presence of a prominent GSRD therapy organisation in our pockets and on our computer screens is radical, nourishing and necessary. Pink Therapy's um, impact is far reaching and tremendous. As an individual, I found my presence on Twitter to be exposing and vulnerable at times. As the years have passed, I've become better at knowing when to step forward and when to step back as a means to take care of myself. And I actually hired um, a supervisor just to um, supervise my activism work. Um, so I've got a clinical supervisor and an activism supervisor, which has been a really great step. Um, I've received personal abuse at times. And while I'm proud of what I've achieved individually as an activist, I've recognised a shift in my sense of safety um, as part of radical organisational spaces. I'm one of the early collaborators in Partners for Counselling and Psychotherapy, a group of 15 organisations, including Pink Therapy, whose role it is to support diverse practice and who have been a prominent force in opposing the SCOPE project, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you. Um, for me, this collaboration has allowed me to be part of something bigger and to channel my activist energy into something for which we hold joint community responsibility. It's a different kind of activism, and I think it's a really valuable one. It was this work, as well as working with PCSR, which is Psychotherapists and Councils for Social Responsibility, for those that aren't familiar, um, that helped me to really see the value in forging out spaces for like-minded people. So when I was diagnosed autistic and came to realise just how marginalised and misunderstood neurodivergent people are in the therapy world, it seemed obvious that collective organisational action was the way forward. Um, so then was born the next vehicle for activism, the Association for Neurodivergent Therapists. We're over a, year, over a year old now, and what I'm most struck by is that I know hundreds of neurodivergent therapists now, not just one or two. It seems like we were here the whole time, but we just weren't visible. With a collective banner and a visible presence, it seems like we are a lot more comfortable being out, and we are making a case for the centering of neurodivergent voices in working with neurodivergent people. It's a power shift. Again, ANDT wouldn't be what it is without Twitter, it's been the arena that's made ANDT possible and the place where our message is most easily heard. It's also been a crucial place to learn and collaborate with other neurodivergent activists and organisations. People often ask me how being a therapist on Twitter affects my practice. In truth, I believe my, my Twitter presence and my willingness to be myself on Twitter is for the most part mutually beneficial for myself and clients. The majority of clients find me on Twitter it's likely that most who approach me do so either because I'm autistic or because I work with people who have been harmed in therapy, often both. At least the portion of the, will I, fit, will I be a good fit for this client question is already answered. I would much rather clients be able to make informed choices about who they seek therapy with and find themselves paying for endless initial sessions or feeling obliged to stick with someone who doesn't work for them. Is it possible that someone might see my profile somewhere, wonder if I'm a good fit, check out my Twitter page, Find me saying, fuck the Tories, and be horrified. Sure. And frankly, I'm glad that they didn't waste their time coming to see a therapist who's unlikely to be a good fit for them. 
So how do I navigate boundaries around social media? The flip side of the coin in clients potentially existing in similar niche corners of Twitter is that we have to navigate the potential that we'll bump into each other online. And um, Silva said some stuff on this that I really agree with and I'm probably going to slightly repeat. Um, boundaries are an important part of any therapist's work and especially because a large number of my clients at any given time are likely to have experienced difficulties around boundaries in therapy. It's an area I put a lot of thought into. My philosophy is that I should know my own boundaries well. I should seek to understand my clients' boundaries too. From there, we, have a collab we can have a collaborative discussion about how to manage that between us. Twitter has great functionality for avoiding encounters with particular people. My default approach is to meet my clients and to only do this after checking with them that that's their preferred approach. Some might prefer me to block them or that they block me, which is absolutely fine. Sometimes clients will be anonymous and I won't know who they are. I obviously can't mute them in those circumstances and it's up to clients to decide whether they'd like me to know so that I can avoid interacting with those accounts. What feels most important is that we can collaborate as openly as my clients feel able and that clients know they are invited to talk about the impact of my social media presence on them. If I say something on Twitter that is difficult for a client to read, they are explicitly invited to discuss that with me. As Silva said, how would reading this feel to my clients is a question in my consciousness whenever I tweet. But of course, I don't always get it right. Like any aspect of therapy, my philosophy is to collaborate, practice in line with the boundaries that we've agreed together, review how it's working together, and make changes if necessary. I don't think we need to fear this emerging arena of engagement. We just need to adapt to it with an ethical mind. Dominic asked me to think about what advice I might give to other therapists wanting to become involved with activism online. I guess I can't say any more than this. Look within yourself, know your values well, know your boundaries well, and know yourself well. Find your people, find out what you need to engage safely, and remember the power of community action. Thank you both of you. Um, it, while you were talking, Gigi, I was re remembering that I'd had an email from Justin Hancock in the week. Justin runs Bish, and he was responding to uh, an inquiry from one of my students wanting advice on supporting, how does, has he done any work around BDSM and young people? Um, what resources might there be? Because he, this, this um, student of mine had um, clients who were, uh, young clients who were wanting to get involved, or were getting involved in BDSM. And Justin said he wrote an article about that, and he got a hell of a lot of closed down as a result of putting this out. And nobody was interested in picking this up afterwards or supporting the fact that he was providing information around safety and consent and all those good things for young people looking into BDSM. So I might, I'm going to dialogue with him next week, and I might put something in the newsletter about it as a way of trying to see what we might be able to do, if anything, to support him in the social media, and um, because he he operates as a sole as a sole trader around sex education for adults mostly, but also for young people, and they pulled, I think they pulled a lot of his young people's funding, so it was a salutary lesson about how social media doesn't like talking about sex um, much. Yeah. yeah, I mean it was a very challenging position to be in as a freelancer when that article went live because there was a very strong chance that I was very aware of that Teen Vogue could have turned on me. Yeah. And um, they chose not to. I was really impressed. Tommy Nast stood behind me. Um, Phil Bacardi, who was the head of Teen Vogue, did a bunch of interviews about it, defending the choice to write this article that was very educational based for young people. But like, I was also very aware when the hate started that that company could have been like, we don't know, we, we, de we denounce it and yeah. could have tanked my career possibly as a result. For sure, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you.